<laughs> I mean, it's a bit better this year. Yeah, thank you. It, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, we, we've been back in the UK for just a, three or four weeks. We've come to you in our Sunday Chad best, but unfortunately we haven't brought much of the Chad sunshine with us, so we're sorry about that. Um, but hopefully this morning, hopefully this morning we're just going to give you um, a taste of kind of like what we do in Chad at Guinea Bortu Hospital. Um, and hopefully it will help you get to know us just a little bit better. Um, but just to remind you, I know you're a Baptist church and I can see you quite a you know, well-established Baptist church. But just to remind you that the highest goal of all we do at BMS is to bring people to faith in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and to experience the abundant life that only Jesus can provide. So that's the abundant life, a, better, a more abundant life now here on earth, and an abundant life in eternity. Um, it, it's an old mission society, you know, it dates back to the sort of, uh, late 1700s and 90s something, um, when William Carey first went to India. But we we have a great history, BMS World Mission, but we try not to look too much to the past, we try to look to the future and um, salvation for people. So, Brian, just going to read okay. a short passage for us. So, we're just trying to think of uh, where the scriptures kind of talk about the work that really goes on in, in Chad within the hospital particularly that we work at. And the time we left was Ramadan, so there was people fasting and in the time in Chad the sun would rise was about six o'clock in the morning and sunset was about um, six o'clock at night. So it's a 12 hour fast for most Chadians that were Muslim. And during that time it's up 42 degrees and they didn't have any water to drink. And uh, we could see people suffering with that. So this is just a, a reflection of the, what we found a verse in the Bible that reflect what God to, says to Isaiah about what he feels fasting should be. So I'll just read it. Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loosen the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor shelter with, sorry, one with shelter, when you see the naked to clothe them? And it's just really just trying to. Uh, Say that God does want us to be obedient to Him, but He doesn't want us to suffer. But He wants us to to act justly and to uh, regard the people we are, the other people that are with us, and to worship Him. So that's just a, a, a way of backing down really what we're thinking about within your presentation. Yeah. So hopefully you know that we're both nurses. Um, when we first started the Guinea Bore Two Hospital, and we were kind of having our catch-up meetings with our manager, which we have every month, because um, BMS supports very well and are regularly in contact with us. Um, and we used to say to, to Steve, do you know, Steve, if, if this was in the UK, it would be on the front page of every newspaper. The things we see would be on the tabloids, the broadsheets, you know, it would just not be accepted at all. And yet in Chad, this is every day. So we've kind of framed our presentation a little bit around kind of the headlines for us. But I think the biggest news flash at the beginning was that we actually finally got to chat and stayed there <laughs> without coming home again. Uh, we don't want to focus too much on, 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 on the kind of journey to get here now, but it, it was slightly turbulent. It was kind of not as planned. And, um, but in July, we finally kind of really started that work properly at Guinea War too. Um, Brian is a nurse who works in the uh, emergency room accident and emergency, or we call it urgence, uh, in Chad. Uh, and I'm a nurse working in the vaccination and malnutrition room. Also, um, sometimes I work with the babies on the wards, the malnourished babies on the wards, and uh, also do some community health work. Um, so that's us. But you know, we, we really appreciated the prayers and support and encouragement that we received from everybody while we were in limbo for those few times, and <laughs> quite a few times, so we felt like we were really in limbo and not knowing if that was where we should really be. So, yeah, we're so thankful for that. Brian's just going to give you some sort of headlines about what it's like to live in Chad. Okay, so just a comparison. So these comparisons are compared to uh, life in the UK, really. So uh, you're much less likely to have access to improved drinking water. So that can mean different things. Improved drinking water would, in the UK would be like filtered chlorinated water that we drink out of our tap. So in Chad, uh, a lot of people have access to uh, a pump in the village, they also have a well, and generally that water is clean, 
are often the well around the air around the well isn't very clean, and often the pumps aren't kept very clean, so the water does get, often get contaminated. And even the water that comes out of the ground isn't um, filtered, so often there is it depends on the ground around the pump, and sometimes it can be contaminated water as well. Um, so it, it, there's risk of, with that with diarrhea and other things. Uh, you're less likely, as you can see, you're less likely to be uh, well off in Chad. So Chad is a very poor country on the on the world uh, bank index. It's about three for the third lowest uh, country in the world in poverty terms, and that means in the general population, we consider about eighty percent of the population is, is in poverty, and about sixty percent considered in absolute poverty, where they've got very minimal resources. <coughs> Uh, less likely to have access to electricity, so we're very lucky in some ways because we live near the central uh, city and there is access to electricity in the central city, but it is not quite unreliable, so it often cuts out for a number of hours each day. And the hospital itself, because of the unreliability of, of the power, we actually use solar in our, in our hospital because we can guarantee what we've got each day and what we're, we're dealing with really. So, and if you're in the south of Chad or away from the city in the north, you're not likely to have any electricity at all unless you've got access to solar or other projects that you can do. Or they've got <coughs> So, yeah. Uh, a little bit more about health in Chad. So, uh, they have a high risk of uh, mortality during childbirth. Um, and that's for a lot of different reasons. So, part of it is access to actual hospitals is quite limited. If you live in a rural region, there may not be a local healthcare service around, and you can go and give birth. Um, and so you might just have someone in the village that looks after you during that time. And also, um, they won't have any checkups during their pregnancy. So if there is a problem with the pregnancy, often they isn't picked up. Um, so I need people that can access hospitals uh, in Chad. None of the healthcare is free, so people have to pay for that. Our hospital is a mission hospital, so people do pay a very small amount, and if people can't afford to, then there is a, a there is a fund available so people never get turned away. They'll always be able to give birth in the hospital. Uh, you're, less, you're also less likely to live as long as you would in the UK, uh, and that would be partly because there are other diseases that you're more likely to catch during your life, so like malaria, TB, uh, HIV, and pneumonia, and, that, and also. Uh, just general health care is they don't have a regular health checkup, they know GP to go to regularly to pick up things that are problems. And infancy, there is a high infant mortality, mainly due to things like malnutrition, uh, malaria, and dysentery, and things like that. So Jackie's just going to talk a bit bit about education in Chad. Yeah, so education in Chad is um like lots of things, dependent on, on your income and the majority of people um, don't get a full education all the way through from, you know, the tops up to leaving secondary school um, or even further on than that. Um, and that is reflected in, in the, the literacy rates which I've used here to demonstrate that. So adult female literacy is about 14%, so only 14% of adult ladies can, can read and write. Um, and we actually see that for ourselves um, in the malnutrition clinic. We often, often we sometimes ask mums if we can take a photo of their baby. And just like in the UK, to do that, we need a consent form, you know, to show that we're going to look after their photo and be responsible with it. And we ask the mums to sign the form, and then you give the mum the paper and the pen, and they really don't know what to do with it. They, they can draw a line. Sometimes my colleagues will say, oh, just do a circle, you know, it's okay. And we try to be really kind of kind with them, just it's more that they understand, you know, and, and make a mark. But it's really heartbreaking to see these mums that really don't know what to do with the pen when you give it to them. It's really hard to watch that. For young people, um, hopefully I don't have like this. So only about 30% of young people are actually literate, read, write, simple maths. Um, and again, that's about money for education, availability of good education. Boys will tend to get more education than girls if there's a choice to be given, um, just because of the, the nature of the society in Chad. Um, yeah, so it's not really improving either. The, sort of the rates have kind of, they went up a little bit and then went down again from what I could see in my research. So 
there's a lot of work to be done, and there is work being done in, in, in Chad, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's going to be a long job. Um, and only 7% 7, 7 of elderly people are literate. Um, and this, uh, their attitude to this was really brought home to me, their feelings about this was really brought home to me when we were out in a village and uh, a lady came up to me at the end of the talk and she was an older lady, she was older than me, and like we said, people don't live so long so you generally see less older people. But she was there in the village that day and she came up to me at the end and uh, she only spoke in Arabic so I had to have that translated. But she really, she really was with another colleague and she kind of took us by the arm and she said, do you know, do you know what we really need? What we really need is two things. We need um, a health centre, because it was a little bit isolated, this village, and we also need a school for our children. Our children need to learn, our children need to go to school. And she was so passionate about her desire for her family, you know, and the generations to come in her family. She was so compassionate about that, so passionate about it, and it just... Again, it just, you know, when you hear people say it themselves, you can read the figures, but when you hear people say it themselves, it really sort of brings it home as to how they, you know, kind of what they want. And it's the same thing, as we want for them, you know, they're, they're no different, people are no different to us, are they? Um, this is a little bit of research that came out of our work. 82% of our neighbours say that their biggest health concern is malaria. And we know that because we did something called a health needs assessment. Um, we took a uh, drama group out to, to, to all the surrounding villages, or some of the surrounding villages, there's actually lots, but the ones that we knew well. Um, the man that you can just about see in the pink and yellow, he's pretending, he's an actor and he's pretending to be a traditional healer. He's giving terrible advice to a pregnant lady about all sorts of traditional things he can do to, to help the lady with her pregnancy, to help the lady's disabled child and to help with her lumps and bumps that she finds. Um, the... I think deep down, you know, the audience kind of slightly know it's terrible advice and they're laughing and, and he's very entertaining and they think it's very funny. Um, at the same time, we were using some researchers to talk to them and do a really quite a detailed health questionnaire about what they wanted. And one of the questions was, what's your biggest health concern? And 82% said it was malaria. So we're just going to give you a few more details about malaria and how it affects people in Chad. So, uh, as you can see from the slide, sorry, malaria makes up about a quarter of the emissions to the hospital where we work, and that's kind of condensed into a period of time. So, the malaria season starts roughly about June time, carries on to about October. So, during that time, a lot of the emissions in the hospital will be caused by malaria, um, and that is ba mainly made up of very young children, so from age, roughly from age one upwards up to about late 11 are very vulnerable particularly to malaria and uh, they often come in unconscious because they get cerebral malaria so malaria is onto the brain and they have seizures and fits and things so that's often what brings them into the hospital um, and they're often brought in very late during when they've got malaria so often they're brought in when they're already unconscious um, and when they're very poorly and sometimes for them in the children it does mean they're brought in too late so they arrive and you know within half an hour they've been in the hospital. Unfortunately, even despite all the treatment you try to give, they die. So that's quite um, hard to see. Um, and just in trying to encourage people to bring their the children in earlier, when they're, because the treatment is much easier to give when they're when they're not so sick. You can give oral treatment, uh, whereas if they're coming back to stage, you're giving lots of different treatments intravenously and treating the seizures and things as well. Um, and Jackie's looking at programs that the uh, government do and also the hospitals trying to encourage people to treat the layer. Yeah, so after our health needs assessment, we did a little bit more work in just some of the villages to find out a little bit more about malaria, what people knew about it, you know, if, if they understood it as we understand it, you know, if they had any ideas or beliefs that perhaps we could work with a little bit to help. Um, and the result of that is that we've just actually started, because it's a little bit outdated by three or four weeks now, we've just actually started um, taking the drama group out again into the villages and they're doing a, a theatre that promotes community programmes that, that are um, implemented by the government. Um, based on the kind of resources that they're given by NGOs and charities and things like that. So there, there will be, well we hope that there will be at some point uh, malaria nets that are distributed 
So we're teaching people like when you get a net, please stay under it all night because that's that's going to make it work. You know, because um, you know it's really hot at night, really really hot at night. And Chatty's like to go for a wander in the night, but you know it, it, if your net getting opened and shut, you know your children are far more likely to, to get bitten. Unfortunately, um, we're directing them to some if there is free uh, prophylactic treatment available for the children, they can take some tablets just once a month and um, that can help prevent malaria. Um, so they're talking about that. Uh, they're talking about the uh, free testing that's available. Um, it's just a finger prick test that, that diagnoses malaria, positive or negative. And so they're, they're saying to people, if you've got a fever, if your child's got a fever, don't wait, go and get a test because if you're if you're a child, a pregnant woman, or over 65, 60, 55, 55 okay, we're going down. Anyway, if you're one of the older population, um, then, then that will be free for you. And, and it's not very much for, for an adult either. It's, it's quite a low cost thing. And also they're just giving a bit of education about like keeping the, the areas around the, the, the water pumps clean, not leaving standing water around to attract the mozzies. And, and things like that really. So that's that's something that's just started this week and it's gone quite well apparently. So that's good. Uh, but this has gone to my little bit of work in the vaccination and malnutrition clinic um, when I'm not kind of working in the community. Um, I'm in the clinic. We give up to 500 vaccines a month. It's quite a limited program that's available in Chad compared to the UK. Um, uh, like babies can have a vaccination at birth, two months, three months, four months, and then at nine months, and then you're done. There's no boosters, boosters, boosters. You know, it's much more limited. But but they are available, and we do work hard to try and kind of ensure that people come back for the, for their next vaccine. Um, it's a good opportunity to screen the babies for malnutrition. Sometimes we don't need to screen them because we can see very well that the baby's malnourished. Um, but if if needed. Um, it probably looks in that picture like I'm giving an injection, but I'm actually measuring a baby's arm um, with a tape, a really simple tape measure that gives us red, amber, green, and tells us, you know, if a baby's malnourished or if they're at risk of severe malnutrition. <coughs> so that's the thing we do. If we have malnourished children in clinic, maybe we found them as outpatients in vaccinations, or maybe they're admitted to hospital and they're now coming back every week. Um, we do see them weekly. We weigh them, measure them, check their arm measurement. And we try to, we have some little programs of teaching sessions for the mums. Um, not something the mums are really used to doing. They're not used to a situation like mums and tots or, you know, that kind of thing where you all group together. But they're very patient with us and, and with a bit of encouragement and a promise of a bowl of fruit. Um, the babies love that. Um, they, they did stay and we've talked to them about various different things from hygiene to, you know, good, good foods to wean your baby really important of only giving them breast milk and no water and no anything else. Um, a play, which isn't really you know a massive thing in chat, so just have to you know encourage development, um, contraception, things like that. And, and they were really enjoyable sessions and it was nice to see not just the mums getting a relate a, a bigger relationship with us, but also to see the mums interacting with each other with themselves and you know with each other and encouraging each other and giving each other advice. That was that was nice to see too. So that's a bit about what I get up to. Here's a little story. Um, and it's we, we wrote a newsletter a few oh I, oh I knew that was happen. Thank you. There we go. Um, we wrote a newsletter a few months ago about how we'd never worked together and suddenly we're like working together all the time in the hospital. So we do, we do go for some teamwork, don't we? And so we tied, we're entitled this one, Teamwork Works, and Brian's going to start the story. So this is a, about a little boy that came into the emergency department. Uh, he was quite poorly, so he was four months old uh, and he had pneumonia. Uh, but it's quite obvious as well that he was malnourished at the same time. So he was received into our department, started on some antibiotics and given some oxygen. Um, and then we weighed in and the doctor decided to, uh, he wanted to admit the child. So the child was, uh, all the paper was done for the admission, but then the mum was taken over to the ward and then the mum decided that she didn't want to stay in the hospital. And this is quite a common problem that the hospital suffers from. Often it's a communication thing because uh, in Chad the doctors kind of say, right, I'm going to admit you, but they don't tell the parents. 
because they just expect the parent to just say right we'll go with what the doctor says so sometimes it's a bit of communication but also there is other issues so the mother often has other children so she's got other children to care for and often they live away from the hospital um, so it means that she's going to be away from her families often it's a transport problem so if she's living away relatives have to bring food in for her because that's the system in Chad that you have like a person that looks after you while you're unwell who does your cooking and brings food and things for you and also there is a, a small cost of, a, of coming in and often the, the mothers are don't always have money often the money is with the father and sometimes the fathers won't agree for admission and sometimes the mother's scared to ask the father to ask the husband about that so in this case uh, Luckily, the lady actually had a friend with her that was really keen for the mum to stay and was quite a good advocate for, for the hospital. And also, one of my colleagues that I translate, translates to me in the hospital is a chatty guy, managed to persuade the mum that if we could ring the father. So he ran and spoke to the father, and the father agreed that the child could come in, and so he was admitted to the hospital, which was a relief. Uh, it seems a long winded way, and it seems like in some ways we're taking the the responsibility away from the mother, but unfortunately that's how Chadian culture works. It's, the mother doesn't have that power often, and just trying to persuade and encourage uh, them to follow good care often takes, you kind of do have to do things that you feel that are maybe not necessarily what you would do in a Western country, but it's how their culture works. So. Yeah, so we got to say that the staff in Urgence worked hard to get the baby admitted to the ward. Um, and the malnutrition team and the ward staff took over his care then and we were giving him some therapeutic milk which we mixed up ourselves um, to a certain formula just to really help stabilise them, um, get them ready for a bit stronger stronger nutrition. Um, and he, he did well for a day or two and then unfortunately we, we got in one morning and the doctor said, oh, he's really deteriorated overnight, his pneumonia is much worse. We're going to have to transfer him to a hospital in town because he needs continual oxygen therapy and will do for some time. And in Guinea Ball, we, we have um, some oxygen concentrators and we have a cylinder, but we couldn't provide that amount of oxygen that the little boy was going to need because we're quite a small hospital. Um, I have to say, I was quite sad because I was, you know, you kind of engaged with them. It was hard work to get in there. It was something we've been doing together, which is always a kind of nice. Kind of projects and you get really kind of engaged in it in your heart as well as your, your work um so i was a bit sad about that and also i worried because you know sometimes in town the hospitals don't get the supplies of things that they should um, and also our project is very heavily subsidized um, you worried that whether they will afford it whether they will pay the money all these things are going through your head but luckily my colleague um, my chatting colleague has lots of contacts in lots of places and she was able to follow his progress by you know, making phone calls and finding out how he was. And we found out that he was doing really well, that the oxygen therapy had worked. He'd moved from the kind of little baby intensive care to the malnutrition unit and he was being uh, strengthened with, with their 45 milk, so that was good. Um, and then when he was discharged from the hospital in town, he came to see, he came back to us for his outpatient's care, which was really great. You know, it was so, it was so rewarding and encouraging. So in the first picture, um, you can see he's the little Ali, he's four months old and he weighed under three kilograms. Um, I, I put under three kilograms here, I found a note on my phone the other day, I think it was 2.8, so it's not even six and a half pounds. This, you know, a baby would be, you know, on the small end if it were at birth here in the UK with that. So it really was tiny. Um, in the second picture in the middle, um, that was when he was just a week or two after he was discharged from the hospital in town and he was doing well. My colleague always, she always uses the expression, he's got some cheeks now. That's what she always says. And she's right, you know, he's got his cheeks back. And that was lovely. The last picture on your right is he's uh, six months old, um, ready for weaning. So we, we help mum wean him with some, it's called, it's called peanut paste or flim flim or ready to eat therapeutic food. It's got lots of names. It's basically a paste made with peanut butter, milk powder, sugar, oil, and some vitamins and minerals. And we mix that up ourselves as well because that way we don't get any shortages. You know, if we can get the ingredients, we can keep the supply. Um, so we weaned him on that and he started the solid food and he was doing really well. 
So I'm hoping that when we get back to Chad, he will be well on his way to being discharged, um, that he would have kept on going in the way and, and not had any uh, um, problems, no more illnesses, you know, that he could just keep on growing again, really. So that's good, a really good news story about baby Ali and the malnutrition. Okay, Brian's going to talk to you a little bit about his work in Urgence. So, Urgence is, because it's a French speaking country, that's their name for their emergency room. Um, and it is Bridger Room. There's five beds in there. Um, there is curtains. Uh, we see quite a lot of patients. So, you see from last year, they saw about just over, it says 5,000, they saw about 5,200 patients in there, which is quite a lot of patients in just one small area. Um, sometimes the patients don't always have a bed because they're a bit short of beds. So, we would occasionally have paper on the floor. We occasionally have two babies on one bed just because there isn't space. So, um, there are many fractures coming in uh, to the department. Uh, from Chad, most of the people either, well, there's, there are cars, but a lot of people can't afford cars. So, a lot of people drive around on small motorbikes and they often wear sandals and very flimsy uh, clothing. So, when they do have an accident, they often get quite nasty fractures and we see quite a lot of fractures. He had head injuries as well, but he didn't wear helmets. Um, so, in the emergency department, we often clean the wounds up and generally put them in like a, a plaster. And, and they have to come back generally to the hospital to get dressings until the wounds heal before they can go to surgery. Because if we haven't really got facilities to do proper uh, sterile debridement, even in our, um, in our uh, operating theatres. So, but it does work, it just takes a longer process for these people, but they generally do heal quite well. Um, we look after very sick patients that come in, often there are people with malaria, uh, so children, very vulnerable and elderly people. We also get quite a lot of people with uh, pneumonia uh, and uh, children with diarrhea and vomiting are quite common as well. And often they need intravenous treatment, antibiotics, oxygen therapy, which we can deliver in the emergency department. And because the motorbike is quite small, so we have one nurse with, with seeing five patients, whereas in the general ward they have one nurse for 20 patients. So they're, they're under a lot more stress to just do that. So often they will stay with us until they're well enough to go to the ward. Uh, some conditions, as I said, that you would normally in the UK wouldn't consider necessarily a problem like diarrhea and vomiting children out there can become, become quite serious quite quickly. If you've got a malnourished children, child and they may develop diarrhea and vomiting, they can become quite sick quite quickly. And often they do get like uh, anemic uh, dysentery, which is like a bacterial type of dysentery, which again needs antibiotics and often rehydration with fluids. We do also see some chronic conditions, so we see people with high blood pressure uh, and also conditions like asthma and diabetes. The main challenge here is to, to get the, the population to understand that it's a chronic condition. So often they, you give them a, a prescription for a week's, a month's treatment and say come back in three weeks and we will check you and say so you've got over that, over that. But then what happens is they don't tend to come back, they stop the treatment and they come back, you know, three months later my headache's back again you know, and their blood pressure's really up high and they haven't taken the treatment. And again with, with diabetics, um, it's really challenging with insulin. Insulin is available in country, but most people don't have fridges. So they have like pots that they keep outside the house where it cools the water and sometimes people keep it in there. But when they run out, they tend to stop taking the insulin and they come in quite poorly with that. So that's just some of the challenges really that we see in the emergency department here. And this is a bit of a strange picture. Why have we got a picture of a bed? So it's just really to emphasize the difference in someone like uh, Chad, where we, you know, we don't have a, a community hospital service that you can ring up and ask for a bed. So this is a bed that was made in Chad. So the, the, the basis of the bed was welded in the, in the hospital. Someone went into town with the phone, and then the person that works in the laboratory part time does some upholstery, so he comes and covers the bed. And this bed particularly was significant because well, it was the first bed we had made that the head of the bed lifted. Because the beds we had before were just flat, so we got people with like breathing problems and things, you couldn't sit them up very easily. And this has also got wheels on, so it's not so different to that how we can treat them. And they're very clean and washable, you can wash the beds and keep them hygienic. Uh, the other two pictures that have been said there are people that work in the emergency department. Uh, there's some nurses, the people in my view are the nurses. Purple, person in green is the doctor, one of the doctors that works there. And the, the guy in purple is a healthcare assistant equivalent. 
and he worked with me to do translations. So he translates from French to Chadian Arabic. Uh, so just I mean, maybe because a lot of people don't speak French, or they have some French, they don't have enough to do medical terms. So he translates for me in that department, but also helps do lots of jobs and things in the department to make it run better. Okay, so that's, you know, you might say that's all very interesting, Jackie and Brian, but you know, you talked about eternity, not just abundant life now, you talked about abundant life in eternity too. So what, what is it that you're doing about that? Because, you know, that's um, you know, what you're all about, isn't it? Absolutely true it is. Um, one of the big, biggest challenges, I think, in terms of sharing the good news in, in a kind of more traditional way is language. There's actually 120 languages in Chad. Um, the main two languages are French and Chadian Arabic. You have to learn French because it's the, the, the language that's used for all the kind of like official things. So hospitals function in French, the administration in town you know, functions in French. So that's why we had to learn French. Um, but it doesn't really help when the local people only speak Chadian Arabic. So it's, it, it's not a practical thing that we can just go up to, you know, to someone and say, have you heard the good news about Jesus? That's, you know, right now quite a difficult thing for us to do. Um, but there are many, there are ways in, in which we, we, we hope that we are, you know, a good light and, and are serving, you know, in that way too. The hospital every morning has a time of fellowship for Christians, singing, prayers, uh, a little message. Um, we try to very much encourage, you know, our, our Christian brothers and sisters there. Um, but often we find that we're actually more overwhelmed by them, by their faithfulness, because they have such a hard life, even the people that have jobs, you know, and, and are kind of doing okay, because, you know, they're professional and they can look after themselves and their family, because life is so risky and so vulnerable and so fragile every day. So, you know, every day someone will pray a prayer of thanks that the illness that their child had last night is better this morning because it really is that kind of line between life and death for them. Pretty much most days someone will pray for um, safe travels in and out of the hospital wherever people are coming and however they're travelling there because they travelling on the roads is much, much more risky and if you have that accident, you're that fragility again is, is absolutely there. And we're often overwhelmed by the way that people pray for these, these daily things that are just so crucial, you know, that we might not necessarily pray for here in the same way. Um, so that's, that's a, a really great thing that we do. We think that relationships with our Muslim colleagues are important. There's a hundred staff in the hospital. Um, a lot of them are from a Christian background, it doesn't mean they're all necessarily practicing Christians, but there are there's quite a core of Muslim staff as well. So we think it's really important to kind of like develop our friendships and work relationships with those colleagues. And um, you know, I will try to spend time with, with my colleague um, just to get, to, you know, actually I love just spending time with her, hearing about her family, we compare what we're cooking for tea, just like any work colleagues, what are you having for tea tonight, you know, that, those kind of normal things. To, to build the relationships and, and we get on really well but also it's really great when she asks me questions about Easter like she did recently so you know I think that's something not to be ignored in this context we're a very overtly Christian hospital if there's a new building um, perhaps all the staff will come for the opening of the new building it, there will be a prayer prayed you know through our Lord Jesus Christ you know to thank for, for you know to thank God for that building so that's an important thing we can do Wednesday mornings is always praying on the wards, uh, praying for the patients. So we take someone Arabic with us and we pray in actually whatever language we can because some, there are sometimes people around who don't speak French, just maybe speak English or German or something and, and you know, they will pray in whatever language and people are very receptive to being prayed for because obviously in the Muslim faith, you know, you're praying five times a day, prayer isn't a new idea for them, but obviously we're praying very differently, you know through Jesus saving blood so that's a really good thing that we do as well um, we have um, regular fellowship with a, a local church in a nearby village that's what's on the picture just the back view you can't see it very well but you know people meet under a shelter in a, a local mission station actually that one is held it's quite a young church but it's very evangelical you know, they really want to tell people about Jesus. They, they also really want to help their community. They collect kind of, they have church collections like in England, but also they collect separately kind of sugar, soap, 
fabric, anything that might be useful to a family, you know, when they go visiting, when the pastor goes visiting, they will distribute those items in the village, which I think is great as well. So they're showing really practical love and care to their community as well. And we, we're very blessed by that church who do send their greetings to all the churches that, that we're visiting, you know, and they, they're very much outward looking. Mm -hmm. they, they, they stunned us when the Ukraine war came out. They stunned us the first Sunday by their prayers, their heartfelt prayers for the people in Ukraine. When their life in Chad is so hard, and yeah, yes, they have smartphones, so that, you know, some of them have smartphones, so they hear about the news. But yeah, just their compassion for the displaced people and the people who are suffering, who've gone from having something to having nothing. And I guess that perhaps, you know, they identified with having nothing, being displaced, you know, as, you know, because of their own country's history. And again, it was um, humbling, wasn't it, to, to be there and hear those prayers and join in with those prayers. Um, also, through through the hospital, people do become Christians. It's not uh, you're not shouting home about these things because being a Christian in Chad is quite difficult. There's no laws against being a Christian in Chad. You're free to believe in the Christian faith, the Muslim faith, or no faith. Um, there's also folk traditions, you know, they're all mixed up. But culturally, it's very difficult for someone to become a Christian, and they will be, or they may be, they may well be rejected by their family. Um, any support they had, they may no longer have. They're emotionally rejected as well as physically, you know, they really do lose so much. And we certainly, we, we have the uh, privilege of support, of having made friends with and supporting a relatively new believer. I guess it's perhaps about over a year now for him, but we, we've celebrated his first Christmas with him and his first Easter with him. So uh, that's really, really amazing, you know, that, that, he, that he asks us. Um, it's, it's not always easy. I on WhatsApp the other day, he sent me greetings from his cousin who I'd met and um, prayed for and prayed with a few times and, and we tried to help her out a little bit in other ways. And uh, I, I can't remember what verse it was. I sent her off the top of my head. I should write it down. But anyway, I sent her a verse from Jeremiah that just, I felt, showed her how much God loved her. And uh, our friends obviously read the whole chapter of Jeremiah because then he asked me really hard questions about Jeremiah. I was like, okay, okay, we'll go to something New Testament next time. <laughs> you know, but you know, that's how much he wants to learn and wants to know. He didn't just say, oh, oh, you know, cousin, this is this is a verse that Jackie O'Brien sent you. He went away and read it and looked at it and you know took it in for himself. And it's a privilege to have got to know him and support him. And we hope there'll be more people like that in the future. And in, in the hospital as well, they actually have, uh, we have two pastors that okay. work for AIM, and they're actually from Ethiopia now, so they speak, have learned uh, Chad in Arabic, because their Arabic is quite different than Ethiopia. And um, yes, yeah, so they minister in the hospital, so they do visits, and they often will share the, the good news with people. Uh, there is a Chadian Bible, so people can get a uh, Bible in Chad in Arabic, um, but people also, sometimes they're French, and French speakers now with the French. Um, and they do sometimes show the Jesus still as well, which I can have in the hospital as well. So there's opportunities to share you know, the good news. And so it's, it's quite overtly Christian. And even in the, the every time like the partner heads have a meeting and that, they will open in prayer and that. So the, the people that aren't Christians, the Muslims that work there, they do are exposed to Christianity all the while. It's something that they, mm. it's a good thing there. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Yeah, thanks. I nearly forgot about our lovely pastors. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. Yeah. so you can probably get a sense that <laughs> probably get a sense that life in Chad is tough. We live such a privileged life compared to most Chadians, you know, because we're, we're well looked after by by BMS, you know, and you know we, we have a house and a compound. We can shop in, we can drive to the supermarket in town. We can shop in the supermarket, and we can buy more than what we need actually. Which is what we need, but more than what we need. Um, but it doesn't necessarily help, you know, when you see the bakers that, that aren't the good news stories. You know, you know, you see several people, plenty of people in Ajans that haven't, you know, lived to make it through to admission. You know, children, teenagers, older people. It, it's really hard, and you see that people just don't have, like hope sometimes, a real lack of hope. I mean, that's something we found when we went out to drive with a bit of work about around malaria. People just had no hope that there was there could be a good outcome this year. 
So we do, need to, we do need to look after ourselves a little bit. One of the things that we like to do is visit an AIM retreat centre, which is the other side of town. It's a little bit of an effort. It's a bit of a tough drive sometimes through the town. You have to pack up everything you need to take with you. But it's really lovely and you can see we get some beautiful sunsets. Um, that day it turned from silver to gold to pink to red to every single colour under the sun almost. It was amazing and that's really great. It was a really great thing to do. Um, because you can just kind of like bask in God's creation really and, and remember that he is in control. You know, the sun rises, the sun sets, and it's so beautiful. And despite all these things going on, he's still in control. We also love to have tea parties on the compound. It doesn't take much. Someone says cake, you know, and it's done. You know, there, there's always a reason to have cake, isn't there? And if pretty much we can get the ingredients to make something and bake something. So... So we're there. So there are things we can do. Um, we can visit a local swimming pool sometimes, or just uh, see. There's an international church in the middle of Chad, and we get to see uh, other mission workers, mission workers from um, MAF, uh, sometimes on some on some Sundays. So that's great too. Yeah. So that's kind of how we try and keep a little bit grounded, I suppose, you know, when we're seeing all these hard things. Um, okay. The second part of our Bible reading. I was going to read that for you. So this is kind of uh, seen as a response to the first Bible reading that we read, really. Um, so when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat, and when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me, and when I was naked, you gave me clothes to wear. When I was sick, you took care of me, and when I was in jail, you visited me. Then the ones who pleased the Lord would ask, when did we give you something to eat or drink? Or when did we welcome you as a stranger or give you clothes to wear? Or visit you when you were sick or in jail? And the king will answer, whatever you did for any of my people, no matter how important they seemed, you did it for me. So this is just trying to frame the work that the hospitals kind of do out there really in Chad. Um, it's the fact that, you know, this hospital is in a very poor Muslim area in the, in the community. And uh, it does offer the people there things that, like Jackie said, offer people out there don't have much hope. And it's kind of, we hope that uh, the hospital shines out as a bit of a light to the surrounding community. And uh, it's a privilege to be able to work there with the other missionaries that work there. Missionaries from BMS, but also from other missionary societies around the couple of other countries that work there as well. We have visiting surgeons, visiting eye specialists, um, and other missionary societies that kind of just help from time to time. And we couldn't do this work without uh, the support of all the churches that support us as part of BMS and all the people that pray for us and all the um, messages and things we receive, it just makes such a difference uh, to know that people are there supporting you when when uh, life can be quite tough for lots of people there really. Yeah, so it just remains, as Brian said, to say thank you for say all your support, all your prayers. Um, yeah. I know that you do distribute the prayer letters and things, but if you love it, want it straight to your inbox, we do have a sign-up sheet and we have some mug shots and some leaflets if you'd like as well. So we'll, we'll put those somewhere at the end. But yeah, thank you very much. That's what we want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have set aside a few minutes for uh, but questions. Here you just about this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just watch a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah, a few minutes for questions and answers, and there'll be another opportunity after Alistair and Sandra have given us their presentation after lunch this afternoon. If you have a question, I hope you have, um, just put your hand up, and uh, David will bring you the microphone. Um, thank you so much. That was so. Um, moving and exciting, and but I guess from time to time things are pretty heartbreaking. Yeah. I know you okay. share with us sometimes. Yeah. And thank you so much for your um, newsletters. And there are several copies of your current one there, so do take one if you haven't already received one. Um, just briefly, I can remember when BMS first um, offered you to us. It seems so long before you were actually. Uh, We're sorry. <laughs> because there seem to be so many setbacks, and yeah. that must have been quite a difficult time for you. Yeah, it was difficult. 
Yeah. It was a difficult time anyway, a difficult time to go on mission. You know, we've got adult children, but parents still living, so not the kind of the most obvious time of life to go. Um, but each setback, whether it was the, the effect of COVID-19, whether it was the effect of the bereavement, whether it was the fact that Chad just wouldn't let us in, or whether it's the fact that they well, they didn't make us go, but you know, the British wanted us to come back out. Each yeah, one. I don't seem to cap it all. I mean, you were, you were there, we thought, at last, and, yeah, and then we yeah, thought... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we actually received so many blessings during that time. Um, we actually had to go back via France, and we stayed at our old language school. And for me especially, that was a real time of kind of closure that I'd missed due to leaving early because of the bereavement. And yeah. God's really used that time yeah. to kind of help us deal with lots of other things. God so, can just bring something yeah. 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 up a bit. Yeah. Now, hands up. Oh, well that wasn't terribly. Ah, <laughs> oh, um, yeah. come to Dale first. Yeah. Say that to Dale, please. Yeah. And then, do, you then have a, do you have clean water out of your tap? Or do you have to boil it? Okay. Um, the, the water in our tap comes from a well uh, into a water tower down to our taps. Um, it's cleaner than most people's, but we actually filter it. We've got mineral candle filters, so it drips through into a lower base, and we can take it from there. It's a bit of a process. And, and what about hot water? No. <laughs> so you hang you hang sort of things up in the sun to get hot water, or you don't. I, I, we've been heating water up in some containers outside last year, but we just ordered a camping shower off Amazon to see if that's the best solution. Because that would be 20 litres instead of 5. And then what about sanitation? Because these are the things that I thank God for every day. Yeah. And, um, We're very lucky, so the house we live at is plumbed into like a sanitation system, so we do a flushable loo. Uh, the hospital has flushable loos as well for the patients and staff. Um, so it's, a, it's better than the surrounding villages would have. Um, Dale, Dale used to be a doctor. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, Ruth? I'm a speaker. Oh, and then Doreen. How are oh, no, you protected from oh, Okay, right on, go ahead. How are you protected from malaria? How is that? So have kids injections like we do when we go on holiday? Okay. So we take um, prophylactic medication every day, prophylactic antibiotic, <clears throat> doxycycline. There's various ones, but that's what we choose. We take it pretty much from... Well, we'll take it when we land in July, the whole wet season, and we'll probably stop taking it in about February, um, just to give our, our tummies a rest then until we start again. So there's a dry season, so between like, so after October when the rain ceases, it doesn't rain till um, April, May. So what, the area we live particularly is very dry, so there isn't really any, there isn't really any malaria much around at that time of the year. No. We, we generally, and the rest of the time, we always sleep under a mosquito yeah. net as well. At night, and all our, we're very lucky that the buildings we live, we share, have the BMS building we have to live in, all the buildings on the compound, including the walls are all meshed for mosquitoes as well, so that does reduce the risk of being bitten. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ruth? Yes, I really just wanted to find out what you found the most challenging with moving from the UK to this African country, which is so hot, and obviously life is very difficult. I mean, I think one of the things that came out. Again, we hear so much about our NHS, but it just reminds me how much we need to be thankful for yeah. our NHS. Yes. But what was the most challenging thing for you both? Um, that's a hard question. I guess it's, for me, it's probably twofold. So I guess, you know, the challenges of just, you know, I was working in kind of community health as a school nurse and then a manager. So to be honest, it's a long time since I worked with who died, if I'm really honest, and that's obviously just heartbreaking every time. Um, obviously the culture in Chad is, is quite different and the way people think and work is quite different, so something that is obvious to us, but why don't you just do it like this, it's so obvious, that would be so easy, but you know, this, for us, but for, it's just not how they think, they think very differently, very laterally, so that's quite difficult because you, you can see something yourself and it's really frustrating. I think the other side is also just the kind of the physical kind of living and cooking. You know, I always joke, what's the two things you miss most? If people ask me, one I'll say hot water and the other one I say Tesco Express. Because when you're really tired and you've had a really tough a tough day, there are other stores available. You know, you've had a really tough day and you know, you've still got quite a process heavy cooking to do, you know, you've decided you're eating, I don't know. 
lentil stew that day because you know and you know that actually what you really fancy is just to go and get something in a packet and whip it in the oven because it's been a tough day like that usually just turns into toast no we, we eat very well but you know that kind of thing that, that, that you know these little things that we take for granted Any, anybody else um yes um holly then Actually, get to a hospital for delivery. Uh, what a year or or, or percentage? You mean percentage? I, I don't really. I think it varies. It's difficult to say exactly. I mean, our hospital has a, does deliver a lot of pregnancies. So most people from the surrounding Cartier they encourage people to come. So, but what often doesn't happen is people don't have any antenatal care before they come. So sometimes they will present. And if they've got a baby that's in a breech position or something yeah. like that, they won't know before they come. Or sometimes they present and they're, you know, we see people come through that are like, got eclampsia when they come in, and they come in with, you know, which is like high blood pressure and uh, a serious condition. So that often is uh, something that happens. But generally, I would say the majority, I, I think the figure is very low. I think it's about 20% of people that deliver probably deliver in a hospital facility. So it's quite low generally. One more. Oh, Debbie. Yes, I believe there is a vaccination available now for the baby. There is. <laughs> and that would make a huge difference. Yeah, so as far as I managed to follow it, it's still being trialled in Kenya, which I think probably has a better infrastructure for delivering that more child. It will require a good kind of infrastructure, a good system. I, I believe what, what I read once is that the vaccinations need to be given at something like five months, six months of age, you know, so between the ones we're already giving. So, you know, like it's kind of a good opportunity to, to, to give it to babies kind of between the vaccinations they're already having, but it's certainly something that will present quite a challenge, I think, um, in, in chat to kind of get the programme in and functioning. I, I don't, it'll be fantastic, but I think it will be a lot work to, to get that infrastructure in place to regularly deliver. And there's no, there's no sign at the moment that hopefully it will come, but again, you've got a two-fold problem of getting people to come for the vaccination, and then you've got the other of the availability of the vaccine when they get to it, so... I think they will come. I hope they will come, because it is their biggest worry, so if we can get them to trust the vaccination to help, then, yeah. you know, yeah. Thank you ever so much. Um, just one, one, one that just comes to my mind before. To what extent has COVID made an impact um, in chat? And of course, in the hospital. Yeah, so the effect of COVID. Um, we missed the biggest uh, kind of impact of COVID because we were in France at that point. Um, but they did kind of have a, a lockdown in chat. There were uh, times of night you can't go out. Curfew. Curfew, thank you. I couldn't find a word. Um, and, and schools were shut in the same way so there were all those challenges for, for our colleagues and things like that it's hard to know the absolute numbers of covid in chad because there's very limited testing and you have to pay for the testing so you know only people that were perhaps traveling or really sick or quite rich got the testing so the numbers are way low chadians don't generally the average chadian doesn't really think covid is a thing in chad they don't really think it's a thing uh, vaccination is available. We find it's mostly taken up by people who are businessmen and need to travel, really. So, but I think the numbers are probably lower than in, in the UK and stuff because life is different. You're not you're not in buildings like this, for an example. So, you know, there's less chance, less kind of more fresh air, you know, for less transmission. But I think it's more widespread than they would admit. In the hospital at the moment, so the regulation from the government is that you still have to wear masks. So. We, we all the staff uh, wear masks in the hospital at the moment, so but that's about the only protection you get really, is just a mask. So. I think at the beginning, I heard from Gareth that at the beginning they had um, they had to put in loads and loads more buckets and water and soap and some health officials did come around and check that they kind of got enough and they did have to buy loads more buckets and things like that for hand washing. So they, they did have a system in place in the hospital to manage. And finally, you have family in the UK. Mm -hmm. Tell us. Okay. Uh, we've got a daughter in Plymouth who's 20, nearly 27. We've got a son in Leeds who's 29. 
Um, my father lives in Broome, uh, where, where we live. Um, your parents are both living and they're in Letchford. And you've had to leave them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And they miss you. Yeah. <laughs> Annette, would you please? Thank you. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.